morning. Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Oakhurst. It is a lot uh, brighter in here. Um, all is calm and all is bright. Well, we'll see if all is calm, but it will be bright in here. I think it's, I like it with the windows open. Um, good to see you here this morning. Welcome. Our uh, welcome and call to worship is coming from Isaiah chapter 9. Uh, Isaiah chapter 9, we'll begin reading in verse 2. And uh, as you are turning there, just a couple of announcements. Uh, this Sunday, uh, we, are, we are starting our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And uh, this, we've got a video about it that I think we'll show uh, before the sermon. And uh, this, this offering that we take up for the month of December goes to support the work of our International Missions Board. Uh, this morning I was we were talking in southern in uh, so yeah we were talking in Southern Baptist uh, no we were talking about what a Southern Baptist is and what we do and uh, one of the great things that we do is we support the world's biggest missions force in the International Missions Board and this offering goes to support those missionaries you might not know this well if you're at Sunday school this morning you do know it uh, but if you weren't. Our missionaries are fully supported and fully funded. Uh, I think that's one of the best things that we do as a network of churches is support our missionaries in such a way that they do not have to worry about raising their own support to get on the field. And that's what this uh, offering goes to support. I think our goal is $1,000. Um, so we'll see a video about that in a couple of minutes. Also keep in mind we've got some important December services. On uh, December 19th, so two weeks from today, we'll have our annual sort of a business meeting where we talk about uh, our spending plan for the following year, and we talk about sort of new members uh, of the church council. And so that's two weeks from today. The spending plan, the 2022 spending plan, is out on the table, uh, one of the tables in the foyer. So make sure you grab a copy of that. And if you have any questions, ask Wendy. Uh, right, Wendy? And uh, don't ask me because I have no idea. I'll just send you to her. And uh, also on Christmas Eve, we'll be having our candlelight service here at 5 p.m. So we'd love to have you here for the hymn sing and then a, a short Advent devotional as well. And uh, so with that in mind, let's turn our attention to God's Word. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. God's Word says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on, light, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot on the trampling warrior and battle tumult, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will be. As we have entered into the Advent season, the Christmas season, being reminded of why Jesus came to this earth, as nations uh, rise up and fall, as governments rise and fall, we serve a king, we have a creator whose kingdom will never end. So with that in mind, let's turn to the Lord in scripture, uh, in prayer. Father, we, we come before you now, and God, we thank you for this wonderful reminder that we have of how you sent your son, your only son, to come to live a perfect life, to die on the cross and to rise from the dead. We thank you that this child in Bethlehem has been born, who is wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father and prince of peace. We thank you and praise you for this good news. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Would you please stand and join us in singing? <laughs> Video. All right, let's sing together.
be reading this morning out of the 25th chapter of Matthew. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the groom. Five of them were foolish and five were sensible. When the foolish took their lamps, they didn't take oil with them. But the sensible ones took oil in their flask with their lamps. Since the groom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. In the middle of the night, there was a shout, Here's the groom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins got up and trimmed their lamps. But the foolish one said to the sensible one, Give us some of your oil, because our lamps are going out. The sensible ones answered, No, there won't be enough for us and for you. Go instead to those who sell and buy oil for yourselves. When they had gone to buy some, the groom arrived. Then those who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the rest of the virgins also came and said, Master, Master, open up for us. But he replied, I assure you, I do not know you. Amen. These five foolish virgins did not use their resources to prepare for the Lord's coming. When it was too late, they rushed out to buy oil. Our spending influences our giving and our relationship to Christ.
we are able to do so much more together than if we were chasing this vision alone. This is our common effort. Together. If you would like to give to the Christmas offering, um, you can go ahead and uh, I believe there are envelopes um, in the entryway and uh, you can put that in our offering box there in the entryway if you would like to give towards the Christmas offering. And I like how that video says we're in this together, right? Um, we can do so much more together than we can do on our own. Would you turn in your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 1? Genesis chapter 1, we'll be getting in verse 1, and uh, for our Advent series uh, this, this year, we'll be looking at creation, fall, and redemption. Uh, so this week we will be in Genesis chapter 1, and then the following week, next week, we'll be in Genesis chapter 3, and, uh, and then that'll take us up to Christmas, So um, and then we will likely be in either Matthew or Luke for that section. Um, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And if you are able to, uh, would you please stand in order to honor the reading of the words of our God? And so I'm going to read all of chapter 1 and a couple of verses of chapter 2. So if you are unable to, uh, no, no, no worries there. So Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. The Word of God says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness He called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse, and it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together He called seas, and God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for the seasons and for the days and the years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great creatures and every, every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarm according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, let the, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. 
And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food and to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God said everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Let us pray. Father, we come before you now, this morning, and God, we thank you for your word. Your word that creates, your word that brings life, and your word that helps us relate to you. Lord God, I ask now that you be glorified through the preaching of your word, so that every heart might confess that Christ is Lord. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Why are you here? I mean, why are you here at First Baptist Church this morning? But why are you here on earth? What are you created for? Is there any meaning in life? Or, or, or who are you? These questions and, and others like them are raised over and over and over again in our culture. In movies and poems and song. And friends, apart from God, those questions cannot be fully answered. And apart from Genesis chapter 1, those questions can't fully and truly be answered. Or, or let's think about it this way. If we attempted to answer who we are apart from God, the creator of all things, then there is no lasting meaning in this life. And life would ultimately just be vain. It would be a vain repetition over and over and over again. Everything that happens here would just be by chance. And friends, if the universe is just by chance, then we would have no basis for understanding our human relationships. We, had, we would have no basis for understanding justice. We have no basis for understanding life. We have no basis for understanding the importance of the coming of Christ, the advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. Present the Christian worldview that's expressed here in Genesis chapter 1 stands in sharp contrast to the chance happenings in this world. We are here today because God has made us. You are here today because God made you. The universe is here. Because God created. There is meaning in life because there is a sovereign creator and ruler and sustainer of this world. As, as we saw last week in, in Paul's, uh, Paul's sermon there in Acts 17, right? There is meaning in life because there is one who has created the world and there is one who sustains the world. The world is not a result of just chance. Of mere happenings. The universe exists, we exist, because we are the result of our Creator, God. As we look at Genesis chapter 1 today, Genesis 1 and 2 are passages that are widely debated today. And there were all sorts of questions that are raised today about this creation account that weren't technically raised by the original readers, such as, how long were the days in which God created? Were they 24-hour days? Were they an age of days? I believe they're weird. they were 24-hour days. What other questions are raised today? Well, is the, were the 24-hour days? Were the ages? Is there a gap between verse 1 and verse 2? What was God doing before creation? And friends, those are all incredibly important questions. 
But as we seek to answer and ask those questions, we can easily get lost in these questions and miss the beauty of this passage. And really miss the wonder of the Creator God. Now hear me, friends. I'm not saying those questions are not important. But many people will get so lost in those questions that they miss the beauty and the wonder of the Creator God revealed here in Genesis 1 and 2. You know, many people stay away from Genesis 1 and 2 because it's a cause of so much debate today. But to stay away from creation, to stay away from the understand, to stay away from Genesis chapter 1 is detrimental to our understanding of Christianity. It's detrimental to our understanding of, of viewing the world around us. And it's detrimental to our understanding of the gospel. As I mentioned, we're going to have an Advent series over the next couple of weeks. It's gonna, we're going to explore creation, we're going to explore fall, and we're going to explore redemption. Three of the major movements that we see in Scripture. And so to stay away from Genesis chapter 1... Is to, be, is, to, is to be detrimental to our understanding of why Jesus had to come in the first place. And how He alone can save. One pastor put it this way, Genesis chapter 1 lays the foundation of our Christian faith. Understand this, friends. The gospel story, the good news about who Jesus Christ and what He has done, it, it calls us to trust in Him. To trust in Christ and to turn away from our sin against God. And it, but it doesn't make sense without knowing who our sin is against. It makes no sense. Why should we turn away from our sin and why should we turn back to God if we do not know who we are created by God? So this chapter helps us understand the big picture the beginning of God's plan of redemption for the world. It helps us understand who our sin is against. Andrew Fuller, an English Baptist pastor in the 1700s, said of the Genesis accounts here, the Genesis creation account here in Genesis 1 and 2, he said this, In the first page of this sacred book, a child may learn more in an hour than all of the philosophers in the world learned without it in thousands of years. There is a majestic sublimity in the introduction. There's no apology, there's no preamble, no account of the writer. You are introduced at once into the very heart of things. No vain conjectures about what was before time, nor why things were done thus and thus, but simply so it was. In other words, he's saying that there's no sort of introduction, right? When you write an essay, you want to introduce what's happening. No, the, the Word of God begins with God. No introduction to who He is, simply just stating that this is the God who created all. I already mentioned how much, is, how much these verses are debated, and modern scholars today treat these passages as anything other than actual history. It's treated much like the legend of Zeus or maybe the epic of Gilgamesh, but that's not the view of the rest of the Bible. Creation is real history. Friends, this account really did happen. In the words of Francis Schaeffer, this happened in real time and space history. And that's the view of the rest of the Bible about this account. But look with me, uh, turn with me to, to Psalm 33. If you look with me at Psalm 33, verses 6 and 9, you will see that this really happened. You might be saying, well, yes, I believe that this really happened. Well, guess what? There are many people today who do not believe this really happened. And so where can we point them to? We can show them that Scripture <laughs> itself declares that this was real history. Genesis 33, verses 6 and verse 9. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. Skip on down to verse 9. You see that it says, For he spoke, speaking of the one true God, Yahweh, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. In other words, Scripture itself attests to the fact that this is real time and space history. 
Or if you turn to the Gospel of Matthew uh, 19, verses 4 and 5, Jesus, when, when he's asked a question he, about divorce, he points back to Genesis 1 and 2. And he says, in Matthew 19, verse 4, he says, He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So the beginning of Genesis... Friends, is as real as the rest of the New Testament. It's as real as the present in which we live now. And friends, if Jesus took these passages as truthful and real, why should we not? Do we think we really know more than the one through whom all things have been created? So with that foundation that this is real, true history, not just poetic retelling of the beginning of creation, but this really happened. What we're going to see as we unpack the rest of Genesis 1 is that we're going to see God the Creator. And we're going to see Him. He is the God who creates by His Word, and He relates to us by His Word. So take a look with me, starting in verse 1 and 2, we see God the Creator creating by His Word. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You also see that, that in verse 2 it explains that the earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So notice how the Bible begins. It begins with God. And so much of the focus and debate on this passage is placed heavily on creation. How these things happened and how God made them and in what way. But what we see here is the focus isn't simply on the how, but on the who. The first words of Scripture indicate the central character in the creation narrative is God, not the created order. The first subject of Genesis the first subject of the entire Bible is God. And what it shows us is that the Bible is not about man. It's not man's thoughts about God. No, no, the Bible is about God. His plan and His purpose for the world. And so the heavens and the earth, we see that God created the heavens and the earth. This is real technical language here. Let me explain it for you. The heavens and the earth, that literally means everything. It's not very technical. That wasn't a good joke. You guys can laugh later. But <laughs> I'll have it my own joke. That's okay. Uh, so God created everything. Literally everything was created by God. As Revelation chapter 4 verse 11 says, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. In other words, friends, God had no beginning, but the universe did. Since God is a creator, all of creation exists for Him. It exists for His praise, it exists for His glory, even you and me. And all of creation is meant to testify to the Creator. It all points to the fact that there is one who is greater than ourselves. That there is one who has created all. As one of my favorite passages from the Psalms, Psalms 19 verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. In other words, when we go outside and we look up into the sky, that they are screaming out to us that there is a Creator. And friend, are you living as if that is the case. Are you living as if that is true? Or do you live as if, as if you are your own creator? You are your own God. We are meant to praise and glorify God in all that we do because we are created by and notice, I want you to see that God created the world out of nothing. Meaning that there was not some pre-existing matter floating around in the universe, and then He formed the world with it, maybe through, uh, through uh, some big explosion or things like that. No, God spoke. 
and the world was created. You know, we create things today, don't we? But we create out of what was all, what is already there. The artist creates beautiful artwork out of things that have already existed. Canvas, a paint, or a paintbrush. Or an engineer creates a building out of steel and concrete. Or, or, or I create Legos with my kids that only get destroyed in a matter of minutes. But I can't speak and make these great creations. No, it's a long and complex pro process. But God spoke, and the world was created. And Hebrews 11, verse 3, points us to that reality. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the Word of God. So that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. So we start here by understanding that God spoke, and the world was Created. And we see this emphasized over and over and over again throughout this passage here. We also see that, that when God initially created it, the earth was without form and void. And, and, and there's, there's these, the, dark, the, the, the darkness was over the face of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. What we see here is that before God ordered everything through His speech, before God was speaking and commanding the earth, it was without form and void. There's darkness over the face of the deep. What meant here is that the earth was chaotic, without form, without void, the face of the waters. For the original hearers, the sea represented chaos to them. It's something that could not be contained. It was something that couldn't be mastered. It was something that couldn't be predicted. But then what happens? A voice is heard. And the world... It's no longer chaotic. It's no longer chaotic, and now it's going to be turned into something that's orderly and something that's beautiful. There's no longer chaos. There's now beauty, and there will be life. And that's what we see in verses 3 and following. We, we see that God creates by His Word. It says, and God said. God spoke His Word, and these things that He said came about. In fact, ten times in, these, in Genesis 1, it's reported that God said. That's important. God said, and what He said, what He commanded, happened. God said, let there be lights, and there was light. So God spoke, and there was light. God spoke, and the waters were separated. God spoke, and there were plants and trees and vegetation. God spoke, and there was the sun, the moon, and the stars. God spoke and there were living creatures in the waters. God spoke and there was living creatures on the land. God spoke and man and woman were created in His image. God spoke and man and woman were called to be fruitful and multiply and have dominion over the earth. God spoke and man had food. God spoke and what He said happened. He uttered His decrees. He issued His commands. And the very thing is done. God, the one true God, is a God who creates by His Word. And so Genesis 1 is showing us and is portraying God as the sovereign King of the universe. Kings of old, when they would speak, what they spoke was meant to be done and put into law. Here we see that the King of the universe, God speaking, and what He commands is done. It shows us that ultimately nothing happens outside of His will, outside of the will of God. He is sovereign and He is in control of all things. Through the power of His Word, He created the universe. And through the power of His Word, He will sustain the universe. One last thing, one other thing I, wanted, I want you to see here is that when God created the lights, this was incredibly important for the nation of Israel, for the people of God to understand. Remember that, that this is written to the Israelites who feared many of the nations around them. And who did the nations around them, who did they serve? They served their pagan gods, gods of the sun, gods of the moon. But here we see those pagan gods the sun, of the sun and the moon were not gods, but they were rather lights created by God for the goodness of the earth. Not to be worshipped because they're created by the Creator. They are not the Creator themselves. The sun and the moon and the stars are as much as God's creation as the fish of the sea or the grass of the field. 
And the pagans around them worship these things as God, but they are not. Rather, they are created by Him. And friends, this speaks truth into our lives today. Our destiny is not held by the sun and the moon and the stars or their interpretations through some sort of horoscope or some fortune cookie you read. No, our destiny is held by the sovereign creator of all things. And this creation account is written so God's people would rightly view the world and that would also give them hope that they are not at the mercy of these ridiculous gods around them, but under the protection of the one sovereign creator who spoke and the heavens and the earth were created. God is the God who spoke and the world was created through His Word. And the creation account here shows us that there is one true God and there are no rivals. So God speaks here and He creates by His Word. But I also want us to see that God relates to man and woman through His Word as well. So God speaking shows us His power but it's also going to show us that through His Word is how He relates to the world. So we have creation by Word. By Word shows God has chosen to relate to all of us as well by His Word as well. God being Creator of all tells us through His Word how we should live. So God creates by His Word and God relates by His Word as well. And as we're going along, we'll see that as God creates man and woman in verses 26 and 27, we see that He is relating to them as well by speaking to them directly. Look with me at verse 26 of chapter 1. Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. And He blesses them, and God said in verse 28, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the, the birds of the heaven and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Here we see that God created man and woman. Re repeated three times in verse 27 that God Created, showing the uniqueness of man and woman set apart from the rest of creation. In our world today, this is not a common held belief that, that, that man is any different than the beasts of the world. But here we see in Genesis chapter 1 that God has created us for a purpose and we have been created in His image. And what does that mean? What does that mean that we've been created in God's image? And there's all sorts of interpretations and, to, and explanations of what it means to be created in God's image, and from a sentence long to a page long to a book explanation. But I think paying attention to the context helps us understand. This text calls attention to how man and woman and, and, and are those who have dominion over the things of this earth. In other words, we have a responsibility for subduing the earth. It means that we care and we rule over creation in one sense. We rule by our care. So in other words, I think some aspect of the image of God means that we manage God's kingdom on His behalf. And in one sense, we're a reflection, not perfectly, but we are a reflection of God's stewardship, of God's ruling over this world. And let's just say this, friends. There is no higher compliment that can be given to any one of us than the fact that we are created in God's image. Every single person in the world today is made in the image of God. Notice it says, So God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. Notice that. Male and female. Not just male, not just female, but male and female are both created in the image of God. And no other worldview, no other religion taught that. That male and female are created equal in the image of God. Friends, this points us to the sanctity of all human life. Every single person has dignity. The sanctity of human life is found in the fact that we are all 
created in the image of God. That's why Christians are involved in the care for the unborn. It, because it's an image of God issue. In fact, if you were to skip over to Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, it says that the shedding of human blood and murder was prohibited. Why? Because man is created in God's image, in the image of God. And so the Christian worldview declares that all human beings from, from conception, in other words, we like to say from the womb to the tomb, have dignity and worth. Because man and woman is created in God's image. You know, that's why we pray for this Supreme Court case that's going on right now, right? That God's will would be done in the midst of that situation so that abortion would no longer be uh, federally su supported and federally funded. Because when we murder somebody, or s killing somebody, whether it's in the womb or out of the womb, that was created in God's image. Dr. Mola, the president of Southern Seminary, put it this way, the Christian worldview insists that the face of a child with Down syndrome is infinitely more beautiful than an airbrush model on the cover of a fashion magazine. In other words, friends, we are those who hold to the belief that every single person has virtue and has beauty, no matter their skin color, no matter their intelligence, no matter their ability to understand things mentally, but every single one of us, every single person ever, born, ever conceived has virtue and dignity because of what is said here in Genesis chapter 1. That both male and female are created in the image of God. Part of this image of God involves stewarding His creation. And we see in verses 28 through 30 that God has given man and woman a task. God has given man and woman the task to be fruitful and multiply, to fill the earth and to subdue it, to bring it under dominion, to bring it into submission. In other words, God is telling man to have a family and work. You know, friends, work is actually not a result of the fall. Work took place before the fall. Work happened in the Garden of Eden, and I hope this isn't going to be a shocker to you, but work is going to happen in the new heavens and the new earth. Work is not bad, it's a gift. Work is one of the ways in which we have dominion and we subdue creation. Rebellion against God is actually to see work as evil. When God has said it was good, and He's commanded man to do it, when you don't do it, you're rebelling against God. Now, I don't mean simply just getting a paycheck. So I understand we're at various, all of us are at various stages of our life, right? Whether you're retired or not, whether you're in school or not, we all have work that God has given to us. So when we complain about whatever that work is, we actually are lying about God's creation. We're lying about the image of God that He has given us, the task that He has given us. So how can you work? Whether it be in your schoolwork, whether it be in your retirement, whether it be in your 9 to 5 job, or your 24 hour job. How can you work in a way that brings God glory? One, one other thing I want us to see here is how chapter 1 ends. So God has created everything, and you notice that after every day it says, and it was good. But look at verse 31. And God saw everything. So He's created everything that He had made, and behold, what? It was very good. So far, God had been declaring His creation good, but now as the six days of His work, His creating work is done, God looks out on His creation, and He declares it very good. Good. And all of creation is meant to be a mirror into which we look and we see God's work around us. God's sovereign work, His sovereign goodness, and His infinite wisdom. Think about God's goodness in creation. That should lead us to be thankful and that should lead us to trust Him. 
When we go outside and we're confronted with the majesty all around us, with this beauty that is all around us, and we live in a wonderful place where we get to experience that, right? We're not socked in with fog like the lowlanders in, in Fresno and the surrounding areas, right? No, we get to go outside, and the minute we leave these doors, we see the beauty and the majesty of God. And that should cause us to praise Him. And that should cause us to think Him. You know. But then we begin to look at the world. And it doesn't appear very good. Right? Well, that wasn't so at the beginning. Genesis explains to us why and how things have changed. It shows us where it's all, where it all started. And then, as we'll see next week, it shows us where it went wrong. How man and woman in their sinfulness rebelled against God. So God created the world as His kingdom, and He declared it to be good. He declared that it was very good. But Adam and Eve sinned against God, and sin enters into His good kingdom. And creation that was once perfect and very good is now imperfect. God spoke in the very beginning, and the world was created. But now we understand, living on this side of the New Testament, that God has spoken through the Word, through His divine Word, through His Son. John 1 says of the divine Word, if you want to turn there with me, John 1, verse 1, says, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Friends, all men and women are going to be judged by this divine Word that God has spoken now through the Lord Jesus Christ. We will all be judged whether or not we are found in Christ. Hebrews Chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 says similarly that God has now spoken to us through His Son. It says, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature, and He upholds the universe by the word of His power. And after making purification for sins... He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. In other words, we're saying that God has spoken to us through His Son. As we'll see next week, that God created everything perfect. He created it good, but then man rebelled against God. And now we are separated from God. But now God has spoken to us through His divine Word, the Word of Christ. And now He's reconciling all things to Himself through the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, there's meaning in life. Because history is flowing, and it's heading, and it's leading somewhere. And in fact, actually, Romans chapter 8 speaks of how the world is not as it should be. And that's why when we go outside, we're confronted with the beauty of His creation, and then we look at our lives, and we look at the lives of those around us, and we see that it's not perfect. And Romans 1 speaks about how the world, it, 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 is, it is groaning, desiring to be set free, Set free from the bondage of sin. Friends, creation will one day be returned to peace that was once held before the fall. When Christ returns and makes all things new. When He removes sin and He removes death from this world. Friends, God spoke and the world was created. He controls the world's destiny. And one day Christ will return again and He will speak. And He will defeat all His enemies. The question is, will you be with Christ? Or will you be defeated by Christ? He controls the world's destiny through His Word. He controls our destiny through His Word, revealed in Christ. So what we've seen in Genesis 1 and 2 is we've seen that God creates by His Word. He brings life. It comes through His Word. And he also relates to us. By His Word. We understand fully and we understand clearly that that comes through the Word of Christ. Now on this side of the New Covenant, we see how God creates the Word that became flesh. And He relates to us now through faith 
and His one and only Son, who came to make His blessings flow as far as the curse is found. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us in your word. It's a reminder of who you are. That you are the God who speaks. And what you say comes to pass. Oh God, we thank you that we can come to know you through your son Jesus Christ. Thank you that you have spoken to us clearly through through revealing Him to us by Your Word. Father, I pray that if there are any here this morning who have not come to trust in Christ, that they would do so today. That they would see that You have clearly spoken to us through Him. So that we can have hope, and that we can have life for all eternity. Pray, Father, I pray that as, as we go from here, but as we see the brokenness of the world around us, that we would be moved to action. That we would be moved to share the good news that you have spoken. You have spoken through Christ. I pray these things in Jesus' name. We, uh, we continue in prayer now through partaking of the Lord's Supper together. Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when He was betrayed, He broke bread and he passed the fruit of the vine to His disciples. And he explained how this is why He came to establish the new cup. So that we could see that He was that divine Word from God. Our own statement of faith says this about the Lord's Supper. It's a symbolic act of obedience whereby members of the church, through partaking of the bread and the fruit of the vine, memorialize the death of the Redeemer and anticipate the second coming. In other words, what we're about to do here is be reminded of the Lord Jesus Christ who came to this earth to live a perfect life, to die on the cross for our sins and to rise from the dead so that we too could have hope of eternal life. But it's also a reminder, as we see, that the Paul says here in, in 1 Corinthians 11, that we're to do this until Christ returns. It's a reminder that He's going to come again one day. And He's going to speak. He's going to judge. So as I read, uh, I'm going to read for us, and then we'll, uh, I'll ask you to come up and, and, and get these elements, and, and then we'll come back and we'll, we'll take together. Paul writes, he said, for, I to live for what... I received from the Lord, I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus, on the night when He was betrayed, took bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, He took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. So this time, would you... Uh, Make your way forward and, and grab uh, these elements. Maybe grab it for the people on your row. And uh, if you need somebody to serve you, raise your hand and I can bring you one. Anybody need? together. Jesus, after He had given thanks, He broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take it. In 
the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as you do this as often as you drink it in remembrance. Let's drink together. Team would record it this time. Would you please stand if you're able to uh, as we close in song?
Um, the weary world rejoices. And uh, if that's a good, isn't that a good description of the world in which we live? Let's pray. Father, we come before you now and we thank you that eternal life is offered to us through Christ. So that this weary and broken world would still be able to rejoice the fact that you have spoken to us through your Son. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. 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 Amen.